In 2009, 28 internationally renowned scientists identified nine processes that regulate the stability and resilience of the entire planet, and they named this the Planetary Boundary Framework. Provided we stay within these boundaries, humanity can continue to develop and thrive for generations to come. Since its launch, the planetary boundaries have generated enormous interest within science, policy, and practice. But what does it take to communicate such important knowledge about how our planet works? On June 4th, Netflix launched a documentary on the planetary boundaries based on the recently released book, Breaking Boundaries. How can films and books like these explain complex scientific findings to a wide and diverse audience? And how do we tell a compelling story without compromising scientific integrity? In this episode, I'll talk with John Clay, producer of the Breaking Boundaries documentary, and Owen Gaffney, head of international media at the Stockholm Resilience Center and co-author of the Breaking Boundaries book. We'll talk about the next frontier in filmmaking and scientific communication. My name is Amanda Wood, and you are listening to Rethink Talks. Now more than ever before, we need to understand what it means to live in the Anthropocene and how to create sustainable futures. Today, I'm thrilled to speak with our two guests about groundbreaking ways of communicating technical scientific concepts like the planetary boundaries. John and Owen, welcome to you both. It's so great to have you here. Thank you. Great to be here. And Owen, I'll start with you. What is the planetary boundaries framework and why is it important for people to understand? Okay, so so we know we're putting colossal pressure on, on Earth's life support system, on, on climate, on the oceans, on biodiversity, on, on forests, um, on the ice sheets. And, and we know this, this system has been incredibly stable for 10,000 years since the start of civilization. And that's, that stability has, has created the conditions for, for civilization. So if, if we know we're putting that pressure on um, and, uh, and we know that there are tipping points um, if we push uh, the system too far, uh, large scale, irreversible uh, changes that, uh, that could happen very, very rapidly. Um, then the, the biggest research question we have today is, you know, what is a safe operating space for humanity uh, in the Anthropocene? And the planetary boundaries framework is an attempt to, to define that. And, uh, and the, led by the Resilience Center, scientists have identified nine boundaries that keep us in that, that stable regime. Uh, and the, the, the biggest shock is that we've transgressed four of those boundaries. We're in, we're in a high risk situation with four of them relating to climate change, biodiversity, uh, use of nutrients, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, and, and land use, large, largely deforestation. So, so, so what does this mean? Why is this important? Well, well, now we have a priority list uh, for, for, for politicians, for the business community, for, for society. The, these are the priorities that we need to address as fast as possible or risk crossing dangerous tipping points. And John, from this framework, what story did you want to tell with the Netflix documentary? Sure, yes. So the story really is in many ways an obvious one. I mean, this is the story of our future on Earth, right? So it feels a big story. And then we've got this fresh new take, which is the scientific insight, as, as Owen has just explained, uh, you know, this idea that you can break this down into something tangible. Um, it felt like a really important story to tell. Um, but then as a filmmaker, you're also thinking, well, obviously, I need an audience. And so it's not just about what is the story I want to tell, but what is the story that's going to catch people's attention? What is it that people are going to want to hear and watch? Um, and so at the time when we were beginning on this story, uh, it, or on the, making this film, it was, you know, there's a lot of, it was pre-COVID and there's a lot of activism uh, happening and you had the, the marches, the school strikes, you had Greta Thunberg, um, basically telling the world, listen to the science. So it immediately sort of like realised, well, actually that's what we need to do. If, if, if people are now saying, listen to the science, then we have the science here in this story. That's the film we need to make, actually explain the science in a way that isn't just, 
you know some sort of dusty kind of academic mm. texts but actually in a in a, a visual uh, and relatable way Absolutely. And I do want to come back to those points on audience. But but first, Owen, the documentary and the book present two different takes, but on the same story of the planetary boundaries. So what does this really tell us about using these diverse channels to communicate scientific stories? So, so you know, filmmaking is such a kind of economic medium. You know, you need to, you've got so little space, so few words. Um, to, uh, to 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 u- to use, um, and then you have the power of visuals then to tell that story. Um, so w- with a book, though, you can be far more expansive um, and, uh, and and get into uh, some some deeper ideas. So that's what we tried to do in the book. We tried to tell the the you know the full story of um, you know, human evolution um, of how did we get to where we are today? How did we get to the uh, the Anthropocene? And and go into more detail on, on what the, the potential solutions are um, and how, how rapidly we need to, to, to change. Um, so, so, so that's, um, I mean, that's, that's the, some of the key differences between the, the two media. Mm. Yes, absolutely. We couldn't get through all uh, 4.5 billion years in, in the movie, but um, definitely interesting in the book. And John, I want to go back to these questions about the audience. So this film will be streaming on Netflix, which reaches over 200 million subscribers, but it also screened at President Biden's climate summit. So very different audiences. So who exactly were you trying to reach and how did that influence the message? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a it, it requires a lot of thought to be honest. You start out and the film is really going to how are you going to frame this film in a way that reaches the audience that you want it to reach? And obviously, first of all, you identify what that audience is. And obviously, with the reach of Netflix, we wanted to get um, a, a global audience, and it's all really then about inspiring a global conversation. That's that's what I see the power of a film on Netflix does is it can bring people together around the focal point to mm-hmm. to amplify a discussion around what is you know the most important issue of our times, but also focused on on this what science tells us about how we can uh, address these issues. So it was about generate getting a film that would kind of like reach a lot of people and just get them talking. Um, but also it was a film that was also. Uh, we were very aware that it was coming out at a time, you know, just ahead of two big UN summits, you know, on biodiversity and climate. Um, and so we did have a more sort of focused ambition in terms of our audience as well. We wanted to have a film that would really speak the science to the actual people who are going to be turning up at those meetings and making big decisions and big commitments. Um, so that was the balancing act, was trying to make a film that had broad mass appeal, but also had uh, a real message for the key decision makers. And actually, when it comes down to it, it's actually not that different. You know, the key Mm. decision makers are just regular people like you and I who also watch Netflix. Um, So ultimately, it comes down to making a really engaging story that is just super clear on the science. Yeah, absolutely. And more and more people are becoming interested in this. But Owen, maybe I'll go to you first. What is science communication currently missing in order to reach out to those beyond who are already interested or beyond the converted already? Yeah, I mean, so I, I, well, I think we have two challenges. Um, I, I think in this you know digital world, where, um, we've created you know a, a system that's kind of industrialized um, misinformation, and and I, I think you know one thing we need to address. Is, um, is 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 that scale and that's sort of working with um, the big uh, digital providers uh, like Facebook and Google and others um, to sort this out because some of the biggest challenges we have are then our ability to just distinguish fact from fiction mm, yeah. and we can see how this plays out with the the COVID crisis as well um, that uh, it's uh, this the misinformation that um, it's a big problem so um, I mean that that the system wide level for communication is really important to tackle. Um, uh, elsewhere, you know, uh, you know, people people do care about the environment. People do. Uh, people are interested in science. People are engaged um, with with climate. But we need to 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 find stories that um, that you know people people make sense of the world through narratives uh, and through 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 stories uh, that have you know characters that they can relate to in them. Uh, so uh, you know, even if they are interested in science, you know, you give people ten facts, um, they they start switching off soon. So mm. you need a narrative to carry that. 
Uh, so the scientific community needs to um, to work more with with storytellers to uh, to develop those those narratives. I mean, I absolutely echo what Owen's saying there in terms of um, it's about reaching the audience where they are. You know, you've got to got to try and work out what's the story that will engage with them. You know, in terms of what is those what are those characters, those people that they can relate to, um, and that therefore makes it a meaningful story and something that they actually you know go away with and think about and potentially act on. Um, and the the only other thing I'd add there really is um, I do think there is. Uh, uh, as a missing element in the communications at the moment and that is we're not so good at um at selling the vision mm. um i think as filmmakers we're very good at sort of saying this is how it is and particularly uh sometimes scaremongering sometimes just seen as sort of pointing out how how bad things could get but w- what i think people are more responsive to is that we can actually um paint a picture of this is actually where we could be uh, and I think there's a lot more scope for that within the work that we do to genuinely give people a vision of the better world that we could have if we do things right. Yeah absolutely I'd, I'd sign up to, to watch that film so absolutely and Owen oh, in the book you say and this is quote there's also a communications problem anything with a deadline a generation away is not going to spark an emergency response immediately. So how do we use new forms of scientific communication to bring the urgency to these issues? So, um, yeah, and, and this this has been a, a, a big issue. You know, p- politicians really work on, you know, what's the, the top three or four priorities they need to deal with right now. And if they're given some sort of deadline of net zero um, or you know, solving a biodiversity crisis that needs to be solved you know, 50 years from now, a generation from now, it's it's very difficult to um, to 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 get the kind of interest that's um, that, that's that's needed. So so we need to somehow bridge that um, that gap. And uh, you know this is one of the reasons we um, we developed the the carbon law framing a few years ago when we left the Paris um, Paris after the Paris Agreement was signed. Um, we we were thinking how do we frame the climate challenge? You know if we want to stabilize well below two degrees, sure net zero by twenty fifty, but that means maybe you could do nothing until 2049 and then hope some huge technology will come along and uh, and solve it and when in reality all the models say you know you need to uh, do the most work in the next decade so, so so we started framing it in terms of a carbon law and exponential framing halving emissions by by 2030 and again by 2040 as um as the most realistic to make to create that bridge between uh, now, the here and now, what needs to happen immediately in the next year or two to get on that path um, to that um, 2050, 2060 deadline. Um, so I think that there are ways of, of framing it like that. I think the other part of it is uh, we are getting longer time horizons. Greta Thunberg and the Fridays for Future movement, you know, the voice of youth who, who will be around in 2100 are now, you know, uh, have that legitimacy, legitimately saying you know, we need to look at the long term, we need to look at um, uh, new, the next generations, and that's forcing a new kind of conversation. Yeah, yeah. And and John, just going on this sense of urgency, so the film coming out now, uh, why was it so important that the film came out now? So why not one year ago, two years ago, uh, when Planetary Boundaries came about? So why now did you feel like it was the perfect time? I think it's just um, there's, there's two ways to look at that. I mean, one is from a, from our point of view. I mean, uh, in terms of understanding and knowing the story, it feels like this is the point where we're literally at the edge of that precipice. Mm, you know, it's yeah. kind of like we don't we can't wait. We we're at that point of, of urgency, as we said, and um, it absolutely we have to to share this story and get it out you know, as quickly as possible and, and and get it to as wide an audience as possible just to particularly, as I, as I think I mentioned before, with the, the two big uh, COP meetings, it felt like this is the moment to, to generate this global conversation because if a global conversation happens now, it focuses the world's attention on these two issues at a time when the world's leaders are making decisions on those two issues. So that was important. But I mean, looking back at why not hasn't it been done previously, and I think that's I think that's about the kind of like the zeitgeist of the moment. And I think if we tried to make this film a few years ago, it would have been 
a very niche film that maybe wouldn't have got an audience on mm. Netflix. And I think there's there has been this kind of broader rising of awareness. It's partly thanks to you know the likes of Greta and others who yeah. who have been you know doing the activism and so on. But it's also throughout the science and business communities as well and, and political circles. It's just it's risen up the agenda. Mm. Um, so it does feel like now is its moment to, for a film to actually go mainstream. Yeah. So it's not just about having the message. It's also about having that perfect window of opportunity. Yeah, mm -hmm. excellent. And Owen, I want to go back to something you said about narratives. So there was something, at least to me, a bit unexpected when I opened a book on planetary boundaries. And that was we, the reader, are behind the scenes at the Paris negotiations, sweating along with you as you prepare for this controversial press conference. We are in the room with other scientists who felt the buzz of excitement, that moment that Paul Crutzen coined the term Anthropocene, and many more experiences like this. So in short, we are hearing the stories about people. So why are moments like these so critical to a story about planetary boundaries? Yeah, so, so I, I think, you know, because um, people do understand the world and, and um, re they react and uh, have empathy and remember stories that, um, that, that are about people that, um, that they can retell. Um, so not, not necessarily about, um, you know, facts and statistics. So, so then the kind of trick for communication is how do you, how do you build in um, a story, you know, about these big, big ideas? You know, it's, 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 it's difficult to get people, for people to get their head around, you know, the earth system or the global economic system or, you know, climate system and this is, um, or and world trade or the United Nations, etc. They don't lend themselves naturally uh, to uh, to the standards of storytellers um, uh, devices and storytelling narratives, um, but there's so many rich rich stories within science on how that science evolved, on how that uh, you know, what was the thinking and the the eureka moments that are really really exciting um, and, and and can really um, engage people, uh, and also at that sort of science policy interface. You know we've been through. So, so, so many critical moments over the last few decades with sustainable development goals, with Paris Agreement, um, with uh, you know agreements on biodiversity. That uh, you know capturing those moments um, just seemed seemed important. It seemed like um, uh, the, the the best way of telling that story. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And John, you mentioned a little bit about this before, but when when I was watching the film. It was both parts a little bit frightening in its content, but also with this dose of optimism. So how, when you're thinking about making these films, how do you balance this message of hope, but with truth and possibility and fragility? So a very thin line, I, I'm guessing here. I'm interested to see uh, how you approach that. You're right. I mean, it's it is in a sense a balancing act, and I think um, you have to make a decision as a filmmaker as to where you position yourself on that spectrum. In a sense, I think one thing I'd say is it is it's almost imperative that you lead with hope and possibility. Mm. You know, in, in terms of the narratives we're putting out now, um, that's actually what is going to capture people's attention it comes back to the idea of you know presenting a vision and get, get, getting people giving people an, an awareness that there is a real possibility for change uh, and for tackling these issues um at the same time particularly on a film like this which is absolutely about the science you need we're not going to pull any punches it's we need to be straight about um what the science is telling us mm. um and i think on this film we we kind of we begin sort of hinting at the fact that there is a story of hope here. Um, and we very much wanted to get that at the front of the film. You know, if you watch this film, you will be left with a sense of hope and some inspiration. But at the same time, we spend a significant part of the film then explaining, you know, what the what the planetary boundaries tells us, you know, just, just exactly um, what this crisis is that we're facing. Um, but because of that focus, because of that science focus, we can then use that same focus, you know, the science lens to say, well, okay, these are the, these are the steps therefore we need to take and that's where you get the hope from is that mm. understanding once you've got the understanding then you, you know how to how to take the next step forward uh, yeah. and that is yeah as i say that's the ending of the film so i think any film has to has to offer uh, an audience 
a sense of hope and also ideally a sense of agency as well a sense that actually mm, right. there's a there's a possibility to be part of of making change and actually could i ask a question of john here john yeah. would you describe yourself as an optimistic person i would actually and i think um i absolutely it, it's almost like a uh it's a way of working and a way of being isn't it it's like if you are optimistic um and particularly, I think, as a filmmaker you know, and a story crafter, I think if you, to hold on to that optimism that kind of like it is only through that absolute, uh, it's called stubborn optimism, isn't it? But that absolute belief that there is still uh, a way to get out of this and there is a, there is a good, not just a, a way out, but actually a better future that's possible. Um, then I think that's actually the most engaging and captivating kind of uh, framing for any kind of story like this. So... So optimism, it, it drives forward uh, positive change. It, it it keeps you going. It keeps you motivated as a filmmaker as well. Um, yeah, I think it's a really, a really important kind of attitude. The, the only reason I say that is because you know, I would say there's a, a general sense of the resilience centre. You know, our colleagues we tend to be an optimistic bunch, I would say, as a, as a group, but sort of facing these huge, profound challenges. But mm. there is a sense that actually, yeah, you know, there's time to act. We need we need to get our act together. We need to provide the science to, to help with that. And I think that that does that's a really important part of the narrative. Mm, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. And and Owen, just staying on this uh, because you look over not just SRCs, scientific communications, but you see communications coming out from research institutes all over the world. So in terms of this balancing truth and and hope uh, what do you see in terms of the scientific uh, narrative does it need to shift in one way or the other or do most scientists have this right um so 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 i think it has shifted over the last few years um you know uh, the urgency has has gone up um several notches you know we, we're at an emergency stage now with it and this is the uh, the, the realism and maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, you know, some of these, um, you know, we, we still had time to act incrementally, you know, reducing emissions, reducing our impact on biodiversity, you know, maybe um, two or three percent a year. Now it's, it's you know, doubling every um, decade we need to, um, uh, to, to to act. So that's, you know, much more on a, an exponential type trajectory. And, uh, and and that that we need to shift gear. You know, that, I can sense that mm. big shift in, in gear in, in communications. But um, at the same time, you know, there's a huge amount more research on on the solution space. You know, right. how, how do we do it? How do we think in terms of systems um, and uh, and and avoid lock-ins to bad solutions? Um, this kind of thing. So um, so I think, and it all starts with the research as well. It, you know, this, it all starts with what are the research questions we're asking. Um, and that's and if they're the right questions, the solutions focused questions, um, that can help society uh, move, I think. Right. No pressure from you, Owen, there. But um, <laughs> but yes, absolutely. Um, and in a similar vein, when we talk about balance, there's there's this need to tell a really compelling story that brings, you know, people around the world in and wanting to to listen to it with this need to maintain accuracy and scientific integrity. So I want to hear a little bit how how you both approached this in both the, the film and the book. So perhaps, John, um, I'll go to you first. I mean, yeah, sure. I think uh, accuracy, scientific integrity is absolutely essential, you know, to a film, even, even though it may feel like a balance between being popular uh, uh, and being scientifically accurate. I think you absolutely have to maintain 100% scientific accuracy. Um, in fact, you know, one error on that you know, aspect within even a feature doc film, you know, can undermine the whole film if it gives people kind of mm. like a lack in trust in what they're hearing. Uh, so it's really important um, to have that scientific accuracy. And I suppose that, therefore it's more about how do you simplify it and put it over in sort of layman's terms if you like in a way that doesn't in any way erode the accuracy or the integrity of the message um and that's the bit um and that's why it's you know it's been fantastic working with owen and with johan and you know people who really understand uh, how to communicate uh, these science issues in such a compelling way yeah absolutely 
And then just the final question. So there must be other countless scientific stories waiting on dusty shelves to be told. So what is the next science story that you want to bring to the world? And Owen, what's your story? Oh, right. Okay. Um, yeah. So, well, I mean, the solution space, um, I mean, I think that is a huge challenge, giving people a vision of what a stable planet with uh, nine to 10 billion people living healthy lives would actually look like and what are the, the pathways uh, that can that can get us there. I think that's that's it's a, such a huge challenge to be able to tell that um, to tell that story and finding finding a way in. Um, I think it's really important. And and the other thing is um, new economic thinking. I mean, mm. I'm really um, uh, the, there's a lot of uh, the the pandemic, the global financial crisis. There's, it's really a moment to rethink what our economic system is and who it's who it's there for. And who, and, and I think that big story of that transformation hasn't been told um, and I think it would be a, a good challenge to uh, to work on that yep excellent and John what's your story it's actually a very similar to Owen I think it's about wanting to re- I mean in, in fact breaking boundaries was was in as almost like the first half of the story it's giving us exactly where we're at now and why we need to act and, and the the imperative for, for action uh and it does obviously lead to to some thoughts on that but i think you know we need to expand on the second half now which is um yeah there's a whole film to be made about mm. how science can lead us out of the crisis you know that that, that we do now have the tools um and it covers all aspects of society you know it's about it is about the financial systems. It's about our political and social systems. It's about in the way that we grow and consume our food. It's about energy. It's it's about these big transitions. Um, and science has an awful lot to say, I think, in how we can uh, we can manage those transitions in a way that does get us to that that future vision. And again, going back to that idea, you know, ultimately, it needs to point to this. This this is not just about solving a crisis because we're facing a crisis. It's actually about building. The world that we really want to be in one that's better than it is now um mm. and that i think is that visionary kind of yeah future vision if you like um is a film that needs to be made or, or maybe more than just one film we just need to be really focusing on that and bringing the whole you know the, the world with us that let's all get together and, and and aim high and go for that future yeah so maybe i sense another collaboration coming on um after you've recovered from this one. But I do hope that those stories get to be told. So with that, I just want to say this has been so excellent. So thanks to you both for today. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have been listening to Rethink Talks, a podcast produced by the Stockholm Resilience Center of Stockholm University. For more episodes, head over to our website, rethink.earth. And don't forget to subscribe.